Okay, we are live. So uh, I would request um, all of you to just uh, mute yourself for a second so that we can start the session. So, okay. Um, okay, so it's a pleasure to get back on the new year and start restart our uh, IACTF, our joint webinar series in chemical sciences. And, um, and we have a treat for you uh, to start this year. Uh, we have Professor Phil Kukura joining us uh, from uh, University of Oxford and is going to teach us how we can use in different ways or in a specifically new way, how to uh, use light to detect single molecules and uh, use that technology to look at a variety of problems in biophysics. But before uh, Phil delves into these two tutorial style talks, I would like to um, tell everyone um, the basic genesis of this series. Um, so um, Professor Satish Patil from the Indian Institute of Science and uh, I, Jyotishman Dasgupta from the Tata Institute, we uh, conceived this uh, series in uh, with a viewpoint that uh, during the lockdown and during the, uh, the, the pandemic, it was very hard for many of us to sort of uh, interact physically and uh, uh, it really affected some of the sort of uh, engagement of research ideas uh, for students and us likewise. And we thought it would be nice if we could invite experts uh, from uh, different institutes across the world um, um, and put together a series where these experts could actually spend some time, not just give one talk, but spend some time uh, developing an idea um, an idea which could be sort of revolutionizing the way we are thinking about the current contemporary researches in the in expanding field of chemistry. And chemistry, as we all know, has very far reaching connections to biology and physics. So um, it, it becomes very interesting if um, not just a single talk, but two talks are dedicated to uh, developing an idea and showing a potential application. Um, and uh, we, we were very pleased that in this journey, we were supported. Uh, both the institutes were supported by the respective, of course, departments across the institutes, but also by the American Chemical Society who stepped forward and uh, sort of provided us the Zoom licenses to organize this. So um, uh, both Satish and I are very thankful that we have had a wonderful one year of almost actually uh, 13 lectures, um, oh, one month, each, each a month uh, where we have had fantastic experts um, covering material science problems, chemistry problems, um, ranging to techno photovoltaic technologies and energy storage. Um, and all of them uh, were very happy to provide us the time. Today, it's no different. Um, Professor I Phil cannot Kukura, change the name, who, so uh, try join uh, any. Professor Phil Kukura, who, um, uh, sort of is developing this completely new idea of using um, scattering based techniques to image objects, nano objects, is here with us. And um, uh, we are very pleased uh, that he has accepted this invitation. And uh, we are extremely happy that uh, we are starting this year with him. I would like to now formally give the honors to uh, Professor Satish Patel to formally introduce Phil, as I love to call him. Okay. Thank you very much, JD, for the introduction. Uh, so let me begin again welcoming you all for this ISCTIFR webinar uh, series. It's a, a, indeed a great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Philip Kukura. Uh, he's a professor of chemistry and fellow of Exeter College at the University of Oxford. He received a master's in chemistry from the University of Oxford in 2002 and PhD from University of California, Berkeley in 2006. So after his postdoctoral stay at ETH Zurich, he joined chemistry department at the University of Oxford as a research fellow and then promoted to full professor in 2016. Of course, he has received numerous academic honors and awards, which include the Royal Society of Chemistry Harrison Meldola Award, the Royal Society of Chemistry Marlow Award, 
EBSA Young Investigator Award, the Royal uh, Society of Herbs and Research Merit Award. So uh, in addition to that, he has re received uh, RMS Medal of Light Microscopy in recently in 2021. His uh, current research includes the application of ultra-sensitive light microscopy to study biomolecular structures and interactions. So with this uh, brief interaction, I invite Phil to begin his first series. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. I, I hope that uh, I'll get to visit in person at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, I'm very excited about the prospect of that. Um, so I, I've tried to um, follow uh, follow the instructions at least a little bit in terms of the two lectures. And so today I want to really talk about um, the kind of technological challenges and the development of um, optics at the single molecule level. Uh, and of course, in, in my case, the focus will be more on um, scattering based detection or you know, label free detection, if you like. And, and, and you know, I'll, I'll try and kind of talk you through how this came about and what the challenges are, how we address the challenges. And then ultimately, you know, how all of this development has led to, you know, what I would call more or less the state of the art today. And then tomorrow is going to be all about what you do with it, right? Because um, on the one hand, there's always the fundamental challenge, you know, how far can I push technology? But then at some point, you ask yourself the question, okay, fine, I've done all of this and, and you know, who cares? And, and what can they do? With it? So tomorrow is all about applications uh, and today is all about the principles. So I thought I'd start, you know, really, really with the basics to try and, you know, put everyone on the same page. Uh, and just think about, you know, what do we actually mean by a microscope? And in the simplest sense, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool with which you magnify an image, right? Or magnify an object. And uh, you could think about, you know, your magnifying glass and then a really good version of a magnifying glass would be your objective. And just like with a magnifying glass, you have to move it around in order to focus on your object, you do the same with the, uh, with the objective. And, you know, when you use a magnifying glass, what you, what you need in order to see something is you need light, right? And that's usually provided either by, you know, room lights or the sun. Um, in, in a microscope, again, you need light. And, you know, that's usually provided by some kind of a camera or, you know, if you need more light, then you might use a laser. Uh, and where then the microscope gets a little bit more tricky is that you have lots of different ways of illuminating your sample and detecting the light that interacts with the sample, right? So yeah, you can shine light on the sample and look at what happens in transmission, or you can shine light on the sample and if some of it gets reflected, you can look at what happens at reflection. Uh, and if you have species that fluoresce so that you can, you know, that absorb light and then emit light at a different wavelength, then you can have maybe a different channel where you do emission. Uh, and possibly you could also include channels which uh, look at scattering light only. So for instance, you can imagine a situation where your laser beam is traveling this way, uh, but you're looking perpendicular to where your laser beam is traveling, right? And then the only thing you will see is light that is, that is being scattered. And then on top of all of that, you can then start playing additional games where you try and change the phase of light and improve the contrast because you're always looking for specific things. Um, now, when you think about microscopes or when you think about imaging, you know, the next question really to ask yourself is, is, is what, what, what are you trying to do? What do you care about, right? Um, so one of them uh, would be uh, contrast. Right, so um, being able to tell the difference between A and B, A produces a lot of contrast, B doesn't produce a lot of contrast. Then the other thing that you may care about is resolution. And of course, uh, I suspect you've heard about this, right? There's been a, a revolution in, 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 in the resolution of light microscopes over the last 10 years, including a Nobel Prize not too long ago. Um, and the basic there, the basic idea is there, okay, if two objects are really close, uh, can I still tell them apart, right? 
And you can think about this very easily, right? If, if you're using light uh, to see them, if they get closer than the wavelength of light, you're probably going to have a challenge on your hands. And that's really where these super resolution techniques have done a great job. Uh, the next thing you might care about is sensitivity. What is the smallest thing I can see? Right? You know, how, how, where, where, where does, where does this end? Is it, uh, uh, you know, is it a macroscopic object? Is it a microscopic object? Is it a, is it a virus? Is it a protein? Is it an atom? What's the smallest thing I can see? Right. Um, then specificity is very important. Let's say you care about one particular species, but there's many, 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 many others around, right? As the equivalent of trying to find a person in a, in a, in a football stadium or in a cricket stadium. And how do you pick out that one person? Um, and then you might also care about speed, right? Because the smaller things get, the faster they move. And if they move really quickly and try and understand the dynamics and try and capture the dynamics, well, then you better take images really, really quickly so you can actually see what's going on. And all of these things, and probably more that I haven't mentioned, are things that people are pursuing and trying to improve the technology in order to better and to understand more. And I'm only going to talk about one of them. All right. I'm only going to talk about the sensitivity aspect. I'm not going to worry about any of the others. I'm just going to ask the question, what's the smallest thing yeah, I can see? All right, so what's the challenge here? Um, so I kind of mentioned this already in the context of the resolution story. But uh, the problem is the size of molecules relative to the wavelength of light. All right. So already 300 years ago, you know, the kind of earliest microscopes actually uh, made so this is where you put the sample and this is where your lens is and you would hold it up and hold it in front of your eye uh, amazingly these kind of microscopes actually have performance characteristics that are not too different from the best microscopes you can buy today uh, why is that well if you think about it you know the, the best you can do uh, on, in very simple terms is about half the wavelength of light because what you're doing in a lens, you're, you know, you're bending the wave front if you like. And if you bend it by 90 degrees and you get an interference pattern, you have half the wavelength of light. And in many ways that, that limit still holds true today. We found ways to get around it. Um, but when it comes to focusing light, it certainly is still true. So what that means is if I have a light beam and I, take the best lens I can buy, I can focus light to about half the wavelength. So if my wavelength is 500 nanometers because of the peak of the visible spectrum, uh, then that means that I will end up with a disc that's about 250 nanometers in diameter, give or take, right? You could do a little bit better, but rough, roughly there. But this is the size of a molecule. Right. So, you know, you see the scale bar here, the scale bar is half a nanometer. And that's the problem. Molecules are really, 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 really small. All right. And because they are so small, you know, just on a very coarse level, you imagine putting something so tiny into this light beam, it's going to have a very small effect on the light beam. And if it has a very small effect, that is another way of saying it's very difficult to detect because the difference in light. And, you know, if the light's coming from the top and going to the bottom, the difference in the amount of light that you get at the bottom is going to be very small whether the molecule is there or not, right? So it's, it's negligible, tiny, tiny, tiny. So very difficult to do. Well, that doesn't mean that people haven't tried. So let's look at single molecules and microscopes, right? And uh, here's the first time this, is, was, this was reported. So this is in the late 80s, W. Murner, who... Uh, it's won the Nobel Prize for super resolution uh, microscopy. And uh, here's the data right, from this paper in the late 80s. Really a remarkable experiment if you think about what they did uh, um, you know, now, what is it, 30 years ago, right? More than 30 years ago. And essentially what they what they did is they they used modulation spectroscopy. So they didn't try and necessarily detect the molecule all on its own. What they tried to do 
was to uh, detect uh, a, a phase shift caused by the molecule in a relatively complex way that was all designed to suppress noise. And essentially, uh, A, B, and C is, you know, this is, this is the, this is the, 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 um, the signal that you would expect from a single molecule. And once you do your fancy modulation spectroscopy, actually it should look something like what is shown here in C. And then they took a sample with a low concentration of, of, of dye molecules and they uh, tuned the laser frequency and they saw this feature here. And if you average all of these runs, uh, you get the thin line and on top of it, the black line is what you would expect for a single molecule. Uh, and then when they moved away from where they would expect uh, the, the, um, the signal to be, then they, then they didn't get such features. So the end result was, yes, I have detected a single molecule optically. And I haven't necessarily taken an image, but I've, I've detected a spectral signature uh, that is entirely due to a single molecule. And just about a year later, there was a paper from Michel Orit where they did a very, very similar experiment. They also took dye molecules and they put them in the crystal and they put them in the cryostat. Um, but rather than looking at the phase shift, they said, oh, you know, why don't I look at the fluorescence? And when they did that, and you can see the zooms here, so they tuned the excitation frequency and they get this nice peak here, right? So as, as they scan across the absorption line of the molecule, they get this beautiful peak, right? So these papers were published within a year of each other, or one and a half years. So this is signal number one, and this is signal number two. So the easy question is, if you were going to detect single molecules with light, which one would you choose? And I think the obvious answer is you're gonna pick fluorescence because your signal to noise ratio is so much better, right? And why is it better? Well, it's better because in fluorescence, you excite at wavelength one and your molecule emits at wavelength two, which means that if you can find a filter, that suppresses this light and lets through this light, you can separate, you, you will only see species that have this property of absorbing at wavelength one and wavelength two. If you don't have that and you're just using your excitation light, anything that produces signal uh, can give you trouble. And that's why you have a lot more background. All right, so this was 1990. And this is an image that I took, I think 25 years later and every one of those red dots is a single molecule, right? I mean, just amazing. I mean, you know, as, 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 far, as, as far as our eye can tell, infinite single to noise. Um, so, you know, I got into this 10 years after single molecule fluorescence started or 15 years after single molecule fluorescence started. So people had known this for a long time. Single molecule fluorescence works, right? Um, and, and it satisfies a lot of the issues that I kind of, or a lot of the, the challenges that I outlined earlier, right? You can get specificity and you can improve resolution. You can do all of these amazing things. Um, and it was more or less accepted that if you wanted to look at single molecules with light, the only way you can do it is with fluorescence because not using fluorescence is just too hard. There's too much background. The signal from a single molecule is too small. It's not going to work. And that's because you don't have that background rejection capability. All right. So then you might ask, so why, why would you, <laughs> why, why nevertheless try? Well, I'm not sure I entirely, you know, I, I have a good answer to that question. Um, and I'm not entirely, con you know, I can't necessarily claim that uh, the motivation was always going to go towards single molecules because certainly when I started, that didn't seem like a particularly realistic goal. And you don't want to set yourself a goal that is so far out that, you know, it, it seems hopeless. But, you know, wh why not? There's many reasons why you don't want to do fluorescence because, you know, the, the most obvious one would be only a very, very small fraction of species are actually fluorescent. Um, so if you want something that is universal, you're not, you can't use fluorescence and, and scattering might be, might be better. 
Okay, so let's try non-fluorescent detection. And we're back to our problem. And let's say you wanted to detect a single protein. It's kind of the same problem we had before. It might not be, you know, now it's maybe a little bit bigger. Maybe the protein is five nanometers in size, but it's still really, really small compared to the fraction limit. So you have a problem. And you will say, well, but I know how to fix this. One way to fix it is I can shorten the wavelength. Right? If my wavelength, you know, if 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 the limit to which I can focus this is five hundred is is half the wavelength, okay. So don't use visible light. Um, use something else as a shorter wavelength, and then you do get a strong interaction. You get lots more information, and you're absolutely right. That's what people do, right? Whether it's X-rays or uh, even better, electrons, right? Um, you can now take images of single proteins. And ultimately, it comes down to the fact that you're using short wave. All right, but I, I like light, all right? And there is a, there's a number of reasons why light is good, because you make the wavelength shorter, things get unhappy, right? Uh, biological samples are not so happy uh, with electrons and x-rays, um, and, but they're really quite happy with light, sunlight, right? That's not a problem. In other words, you can look at dynamic processes. Uh, you can look at you know living cells. You can do uh, uh, you can do the experiments in a fashion that is compatible with things changing, rather than them being static. And and most of what you know X rays and electrons do is deal with static samples. All right. So we're still we've convinced ourselves light is a good idea. And we don't want to do fluorescence, all right? So what are you gonna do? Well, light scattering would be one, all right? So here's, here's an example, right? Uh, uh, single molecules, single ion scattering, right? So this is this, this is this experiment that I basically just described to you where imagine a laser beam is traveling this way and you're looking at 90 degrees. Uh, and this is from, from, from Oxford here, uh, and what they're studying is they're studying single ions and traps. So take one ion, they put it in a trap, uh, and they you know do experiments on a single ion. And what David did, so this is a picture of his trap. You know, there's a big um, uh, vacuum chamber, and there's a little window, and he took his camera, his you know a good uh, camera with which you, you know like a Nikon or something. You know, some camera with which you take pictures of birds or sceneries or your family, whatever took a picture of his of his trap uh, and then he loaded the trap and took another one and what you see here is you know with a normal camera you can see one iron there it is so what is the limit of light scattering well the light scattering limit is one atom you can do it so why does this work bill question yeah 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 so so Iron, you mean to say an uh, elemental ion or a molecular yeah, ion? Just, what kind of I, I don't know. This might be calcium ion. I don't know. Calcium I don't exactly ion. Know okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah so so elemental. Know. Elemental. Yeah. So it's a yeah. single yeah. atom. Okay. Yeah. So this is not fluorescence. This is scattering. Why does it work? Well, the reason why it works is because your laser beams traveling that way and you're looking from where I am and the ion is trapped in vacuum. So there is nothing else there that could send light towards my eye. The only thing that can send light towards my eye is the ion. In other words, in principle, scattering should work just as well as fluorescence if there is no background. And you can convince yourself that in principle that should be true because in order to get fluorescence, light has to be absorbed by the molecule before it gets re-emitted. So the interaction the fundamental interaction strength is the same. It's not like fluorescence is magically stronger. Fundamental interaction strength is, 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 is comparable. Um, uh, but in one case, it's really easy to suppress the background. In the other case, you have to build a trap and trap an ion in vacuum. It's really hard. And you're not going to go trapping you know, proteins in vacuum to figure out what's going on. Fine. So 
if you want to study biomolecules, if you want to do studies in the condensed space, what are your options? So this is this is the kind of experiment that I just described, right? You've, tr you've trapped an ion and you've arranged your optics in such a way that your illumination light does not go into your collection optics and you have a detector. In a biologically compatible environment, the equivalent is what people call total internal reflection. So this is a trick where you have a prism or you can do it differently where essentially light is reflected at an interface perfectly reflected. If you just get the angle right, it gets reflected. Uh, but then when it gets reflected, there is an evanescent field. So the, the, the field strength is not zero immediately. It kind of decays exponentially. So if you put an object just at the interface, that object will experience that evanescent field. And because it's a scatterer, just like the iron was a scatterer on the previous slide, some of that light that is evanescent will get scattered out. So if you put an objective on the other side of this, you can collect that scattered light. Perfect, right? You have a laser beam that is being reflected and you're collecting the light scattering. It's the same experiment as this one should work just as well. Well, unfortunately it doesn't uh, because it will only be perfect if your interface is perfect, atomically flat, completely. There's no impurities, nothing. As soon as there's anything there, like the particle you're trying to detect, you're going to get background. And it turns out that your detection limit, if you build a really, really good version of this, is on the order of 20 nanometer gold. That's or roughly that's where it was. So why did I pick a gold particle? Well, gold particles are metallic, right? They're shiny. Um, they happen to scatter light really efficiently. So you can have a really small object and it still scatters a lot of light. So this is the smallest particle you can see. And the fundamental reason here is if you look at the scattering cross section, the scattering cross section scales with the volume squared and the optical properties. So if you think about it, if you go from 100 nanometers, uh, 100 nanometer diameter to 10 nanometer diameter, you lose a factor of a million in signal. That's a lot of signal to lose. So the scaling is against you. And as your particles get smaller, the amount of light they scatter gets less and less. And less. And if you do the calculation, uh, you can ask yourself, say, well, I have a rough idea what the cross scattering cross section is for a gold particle. And I can probably figure out what the scattering cross section is for a protein. Um, uh, so, you know, how big are they relative to each other? This is my detection limit for gold. And the answer is it's about a million times bigger than scattering cross section for protein. So, in other words, this is never going to work, right? I mean, the smallest signal I can see is a million times bigger than the signal I need to see for a signal to noise ratio of one. So it's never going to work. Um, fine, so you could give up or you could say, well, maybe not quite yet. Let's, let's, let's think about this a little bit differently. So let's go back to the basics. Remember I said, if I take a molecule and you put it in the focus beam, the interaction is going to be very small. You're right, it's very small but it's not zero, it's just very small. And in fact, you know, a simple estimate tells you that it's about a part per million, 10 to the minus six. Now, either you can look at 10 to the minus six and think that's a number I can measure, or you can think that's a number I can never measure. But in principle, you know, why should you not be, you know, people have measured 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 19, you know, atomic clocks, I mean, crazy precision. So people are measuring 10 to the minus 17. Why can't I measure 10 to the minus 16? So here's some early attempts. And unsurprisingly, this is from W.D. E. Murner, right? Where basically he, he said, you know, can I do an experiment similar to the one that I did in a cryostat? Can I do this at room temperature? Uh, and, and they used a, you know, a, 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 a special interferometric setup in order to measure the phase shift, and they got to something like 20 molecules detection limit. All right, this was in 2006. Um, and I got into this in a roundabout way. Um, and then we built what you could consider the simplest version, which is essentially exactly the setup that I've been drawing. Remember, you have a focus beam and you put a molecule inside. Question. Sorry, to... sorry. Yeah. sorry. Again, interrupting you. Sorry. No, uh, in, in the twenty molecules uh, that they estimated, is this was in solution or in a solid? 
Uh, it was in a solid. It was in a solid. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. They have to be in a particular place of the work camera to work. All right. So here's what we did. We took a laser, uh, and uh, we split it in two. Uh, one just went to a detector and the other one went through a microscope and the microscope consists of two objectives. So it's essentially your two lenses. Uh, the two lenses focused the beam and then we had a sample with single molecules in it. Really not that different from, you know, W. Murner set up a long time ago. But you could think of this as like a UV vis experiment with one molecule, right? That's essentially what it is. Uh, so one beam goes here, the other beam goes there, and then we use this, this, this piece of kit, this magical piece of kit called a balanced photodetector, which is essentially two carefully chosen photodiodes and then some fancy electronics um, that essentially enable you to eliminate uh, common mode noise. All right. So if the, if, the, if the laser intensity is fluctuating, it's fluctuating in this arm and in this arm. So if you have a balanced detector, it will take out all of that, all of those fluctuations. And with this approach, uh, we were able to essentially eliminate laser intensity fluctuations down to the shot noise limit. So, you know, it's, it's measuring as good as you can in, in simple terms. And we also, for convenience, gave ourselves another channel which allowed us to measure fluorescence at the same time. Remember, because seeing fluorescence is really easy. And we took dye molecules uh, because we wanted to convince ourselves that we're seeing single molecules. Uh, and essentially what we're doing here is we're measuring the fluorescence. And at the same time, we're also measuring the difference between the light going through the microscope versus the light not going through the microscope. And if there is a molecule here, that will be different than if there is no molecule. That's the idea. All right, so what does the data look like? So this is this, this is an image of the fluorescence image and you can see beautiful, amazing, super duper fluorescence. And one of, the, one of the ways you know that you have one molecule is these molecules bleach. And if you have one molecule, you have lots of, lots of fluorescence, lots of fluorescence, bleaching, nothing. Okay, I have one molecule. And so then what we did in order to get to average more and reduce the noise, rather than try and take an image with the scattering uh, or the extinction, we just, we just scanned over this line over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what you see here, right? So I'm scanning and again and again, this is the number of lines. And I have fluorescence, 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 and here it bleaches and the fluorescence is gone. And what you see here is what we saw on the, on the balanced photo detector. And it's exactly the same thing. So you scan, you scan, you scan, you scan, you scan. And you can see there's a little bit dark stuff here. And then when it bleaches, the dark stuff disappears. It's good news, right? Because my molecule is absorbing light. So I'm getting less light on my detector. And when it bleaches, it's no longer absorbing light. And I'm getting more light on the detector. That's exactly what I expect. Uh, so here's the difference between the fluorescent signal uh, before and after photo bleaching, very good signal to noise ratio. And here's the difference between uh, the extinction signal before and after bleaching. All right. And if you look at the size of the signal, you see this is about three times 10 to the minus six. Physics works, right? It's roughly where it was supposed to be. It was actually a little bit bigger than we expected because when you measure uh, uh, absorption cross sections, you do it in solution. And of course, molecules <laughs> don't have any orientation. Here, we picked molecules that were super bright, which means that the, polar, the dipole was aligned with our excitation polarization. So we got a little bit more signal. All right. So the answer is you can do it. All right. You, you can see a single molecule. Uh, and you will say, but why? <laughs> This looks so much better than that. Why would you? Why would you do that? Well, in the first instance, it was just a question of you know what is actually possible. Can, can you can you actually make this work? And the answer is yes, you can. And now you might say, well, congratulations, but you're still doing this with a dye molecule. 
right? So the entire argument as to why you didn't want to use fluorescence has just gone out the window because the only way you can make it work is if you have a molecule that's really, really good at absorbing light. So what about non-resonant interactions, right? So I'm not looking at a dye molecule which has a super duper dipole. I just want to see a single protein. Can I see a single protein? How do I, how do I think about doing that? All right, so I'm gonna try and change your thinking here a little bit. How do you detect small things really efficiently? So you will all have seen this at some point in your lives and I'm gonna make the claim that this is probably the smallest thing you've ever seen with your own eyes. So you know what this is, it's an oil film on top of water. Uh, and you can see, you can see slightly different colors. If you're not colorblind like me, if you're colorblind, you see slightly different intensities. And what's happening is quite simple, right? You have light that's coming from the sun and some of it is getting reflected at the oil air interface. And some of it is getting reflected at the water oil interface. And those two reflections interfere with each other. And depending on the thickness of the oil film, different uh, wavelengths interfere constructively or destructively in terms of the reflection that hits your eye. And it turns out, you know, if the film is 100 nanometers, it will look green. And uh, if it's uh, uh, 95 nanometers, it will look orange. So your eyes are able to tell a difference on a length scale of five nanometers, which is the size of a single protein, which is amazing, right? I mean, using the sun as a light source and your eyes as a detector, and you can see five nanometers, all right? Of course, where I'm cheating here is that you're averaging over large uh, areas, right? Because I've got the whole freaking pond that I'm looking at. Um, well, the answer to that is just do the same experiment in the microscope. Right? Because now I can confine laterally to 200 nanometers and I should be able to use the same interference. So now I'm getting pretty close, right? Five nanometer difference, 200 nanometers, not so different, any, not so badly different anymore compared to the size of the protein. There's a question in the chat. There's a question, yes, yes. Yeah. Even question... if the dye bleaches, there would be some loss by scattering. Is that also taken into account? Uh, yes, you're right. Well, it's not, I mean, I think the answer is, I don't know. Uh, all I know is, is that the loss of light that I had due to absorption is now gone. You're, you're right that there would still be some scattering from the molecule itself, but I think that would be really, really, really small because it's like a, it's like a half a nanometer sized rock. I mean, it's, it's really tiny. Um, the, the, what I'm really detecting here is the, is the loss of the, of the transition dipole, which is large polarizability, so an efficient interaction between light um, uh, uh, and the molecule. I, I hope that helps. All right, so I'm doing this experiment. I'm going to do this experiment in a microscope. And of course, that's not me. That was done a long time ago, right? So uh, this, this goes all the way back to the 60s. Um, it was in initially called interference reflection microscopy. And then it, it re-emerged as reflection interference contrast microscopy, RISM. But the idea is essentially the same. Uh, is essentially this one, right? You're doing this experiment on a microscope, but rather than shining light from the top, you actually shine light through the microscope and look at what comes back. And if you think about a cell on a cover slip, right? Uh, you will have reflections from different parts of the cell. And essentially you'll get the same kind of interference behavior that you have from different thicknesses of oil, right? Because oil is, has a different refractive index, different optical properties to water, and that's giving you this pattern. And a cell has different refractive index to water. And that's also giving you the pattern just on a small scale. And people use this for a long time to understand how cells adhere to surfaces because you can, you can actually measure the thickness of the cell with really quite high accuracy. And the reason why you can do that is because you're using interference. Remember the five nanometers already makes a big difference. Fine, so, but we're trying to get smaller. So how do you get smaller? Well, uh, then in the early nineties, you know, Brad Amos 
um, you know, one of the pioneers in confocal microscopy, they were building these, these confocal microscopes and usually they were using fluorescence. Um, but because, you know, they were the pioneers, they thought, oh, maybe we can just look at the scattering as well. So it's essentially a laser light source, a beam splitter, they shine light on the sample, look at the light that comes back. And what they looked at were microtubules. So microtubules are these filaments, uh, um, you know, about 25 nanometers in diameter, and the diffraction limit is about 200 nanometers or so. And when they looked at these microtubules on the gloss cover slip, they saw this. Right, so you see all these nice black lines, and those are your microtubules. And this is an amazing image. Um, you know, they were really just interested in microtubules. They didn't really think too much about it. And of course, then people could fluorescently label it and it looked even better, so nobody cared and nobody worried about it. But you can do a calculation. You can, you can calculate how many balls you have over a 240 nanometer diffraction limited spot, how many proteins, each of these balls is one protein. And the answer is, uh, and, then, and then you look at the background noise, so you can evaluate what is the sensitivity limit of this microscope in terms of detecting proteins. And the answer is about 300, which is astonishing, right? I mean, people have been trying to build label-free biosensors you know, for decades, whether it's SPR or BLI and all, all kinds of techniques. Um, this had a sensitivity of 300 protein molecules 30 years ago. It's just that it, they didn't think about it necessarily in that, in that sensitivity context. But I'm pretty sure that, that this must have been by a long way the most sensitive uh, uh, label-free biosensor out there. All right, so I got into this uh, quite a bit later. Um, uh, and we did something similar, you know, there's a laser illuminating uh, a sample that's sitting on a piece of glass. And then you look at the light that comes back at the glass water interface and you put it on the camera. And we call this iSCAT uh, or interferometric scattering microscopy. And, and probably the key thing that, that we brought to the table, at least from my personal perspective is that is, is maybe an obvious realization in hindsight, but I think it was nevertheless an important one in the context of the whole field, which is uh, if you think about uh, your signal to noise ratio, which is essentially the optical contrast that you see divided by the background fluctuations, because of the way this experiment works, your signal to noise ratio is essentially equal to the contrast multiplied by the square root of the number of photons you detect. So what does that mean? If I make n bigger, I can improve my signal to noise ratio. And if I want it to be bigger than one, no matter how small my contrast actually is, I can always lift it above one if I just make n big enough, right? How do you make n big? Well, you need lots of photons, so you need a laser source. And, uh, uh, you know, you either put more and more light on or you integrate it for longer, or you do both. But as long as n goes up, and if you do the experiment perfectly, so this only holds if the only noise source in your limit in your in your image is shot noise. So you know the intrinsic fluctuations of photon arrival. If you do the experiment perfectly, it does, does not matter how small the contrast is, you will be able to see it as long because you can always put more n in. In other words, Yes, it may look bleak and the signal may be very small from a single protein, but you should be able to see it. You just have to integrate long enough and make sure that your signal, that your, that your image is, is entirely shot noise limited. All right, so let's think, of, so if this is so simple, why hasn't everybody done this? Right, what's the problem? What's the big deal? Why, why, why not do this? All right, so let's think about image formation, nice guys. So this microscope, very simple, right? Laser. Objective, sample, beam splitter, so the light that comes back, reflected, goes into a camera, right? So when you, when you build a setup, what you will get is what you see here. And which means you've spent, you know, depending on what parts you use, anywhere between two and between three and 30,000 pounds on components. And then what you've done is you've taken an image of your laser beam. 
right? In a really, really complicated way, you've taken, this is an image of my laser. So this is, you know, how am I going to see a tiny, tiny signal? It's never going to work. Um, you know, there's huge variation in intensity. It's inhomogeneous. You, you're not going to see it. But uh, what you can do is you can translate the sample, right? And if I move the sample, assuming that my laser is a good laser, let's assume my laser is a good laser. If I move the sample and I move it horizontally, the only thing that's going to change is the image, right? This pattern is going to stay the same. So it's just the background. So I can just subtract it. And indeed, when you do that, you get this. All right. So what is this? Well, it looks like variations in the reflectivity, almost like a speckle pattern on the order of a few percent. Uh, and this is uh, from the cover glass. This is, if you take microscope cover glass, it's not perfectly smooth. It has slight roughness and that slight roughness produces this pattern. All right. Okay, so you say fine. Congratulations, now you've measured the reflectivity of microscope cover glass. What does that mean, right? Well, let me just give you a few more tricks because, you know, to explain why nobody's done this. So the other thing you'll see, so here we put some nanoparticles on, you can see the nanoparticles and you have lots of noise. So you need to take the noise out. And if you can measure the background without the nanoparticles, now you get a much better image. And essentially what we do there is we take a median, so, uh, we translate the sample with time and we see all of this, you know, uh, you see the particles come in, but if you take the medium pixel value, you get a really good background image and you can remove the noise. And then maybe you have some fringes interference patterns because you're doing interference. And then if you filter it well, then you can get rid of those as well. And if you play all of these games and you build a really good setup that's stable and, you know, do all the right things, then you get an image like this. Um, and uh, essentially what you see here is now I haven't used microtubules, I have used actin. So actin is now not 13 filaments, it's just one. Uh, and you can just about see these lines, you know, quite thin lines. Uh, but you also see the speckly pattern from the cover glass. And if you do the same calculation and ask what is the detection limit, then the detection limit now is 70 proteins. All right, so still not a one. What am I gonna do? Well, the answer is, is a little bit like here, right? So your, your detection is 70 proteins because you have so much background. How are you gonna see one protein? Which is the same question as uh, some of you may have asked yourself when you look at these books. I don't know whether you know this is, I think they're called Where's Wally or Where's Waldo, depending on what country you're in. And it's, it's like these parents torturing devices where in the evening when everyone's exhausted, you have to go and find Wally and his friend and the dog and the keys, and they're all hidden somewhere in images like this, which is not too different from finding a single protein in this mess, right? Right, so we're looking for odd law. This is odd law, right? So I give you 10 seconds to find odd law. Let's see if anyone can find odd law. It's hard, right? I mean, oh, yes. anyone see odd law? No. No, no it's difficult. Okay. How, how about now? Can, can you see odd law now? Yeah. Right? Yes. And the trick is, all I have to do is I have to take one image with odd law and one image without odd law. And if I subtract the image without odd law from the image with odd law, I get odd law. All right. So... Uh, that's essentially what you do. You have a horrible background image. You have the same horrible background image. You subtract the two horrible background images from each other, and you only see the change. So we've done this once when we removed the laser beam, and now we've done it again when we remove the background. Uh, and essentially, you get from a situation where, you know, this is 8%. Now you see how much this is like a factor of... Uh, uh, at least a factor of 10, if not a factor of 50 smaller, the Z scale between these images. And when you do that, uh, here's your actin, 
We added a molecular motor called myosin-5, which lands on the actin. If you add ATP, it lands and it moves. We subtract this image and we get a movie like this. Right? You see these little black dots and they can happen to coincide with the lines where the actin is. And when you get really lucky, you get a movie like this. And you can see that the little black dot is kind of jumping forward. The reason why it's jumping forward is because the motor takes steps and those steps are 37 nanometers, right? And that's, that's essentially what you, what you see here. Uh, Phil, question. Yeah. Or maybe we can ask other people also along with me. Um, uh, what is the, so, so, so you were taking, how big are these images? These are sort of 10 microns. Yeah, 10 microns. You know, six by six microns. Six by six like microns. That. How yeah. long are you? Averaging, like, how are you? How long are you sort of uh, taking? How, how, how I think this is, this is this is this is real time. Okay, so you this movie is roughly real time, right? And and um, to build up a background image with the motor and without the motor, how long does that take? Few sec, few uh, milliseconds, hundred milliseconds or something. Milliseconds, Quick. hundred milliseconds. Yeah, hundred milliseconds. Yeah. Okay. okay, and and uh, so if you were to just calculate what the contrast that you're achieving here is roughly how much it's. Uh, the so here you see the noise. number. It's a, right. So the contrast okay. is about point point one percent, point two percent. Right. Uh, and so the detection limit in this was something like fifty or sixty kilodalton. Okay. And um, okay. what would be the laser fluence that you're using here? In the sense, the uh, it's a big number, big number, hundreds okay. of kilowatts per square centimeter. But um, okay, there is no dye. Right, right. So nothing's absorbing your light. Right, it's all non-resonant. This is basically yeah. non-resonant. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so hundreds of kilowatt per centimeter square. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so we can see single molecules, pixel size, pixel size. I think this is probably about 80 nanometers or something like that. 18, 19 nanometers is the pixel size. So uh, about a third of an ARRI disk, roughly. All right, so we can see single molecules and we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. We can see individual proteins just by shining light on a sample, looking at the light from back and we wrote this paper and submitted it and like, oh, this is amazing, amazing, amazing. And the referees went, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? It looks so much better if you use fluorescence. Right. I said, oh, okay, you know, can we do better? So the problem is here. This is a still image. You see all the little black dots, great. And you see the Z scale goes from 10 to the minus 10 to the minus three to plus 10 to the minus three. And what you're doing is you're fighting against shot noise. Uh, I've got a question here. Yes, Vivek, could you, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to ask it at this point before you move ahead. So, uh, the, you know, as the actin is uh, jumping over the microtubule, I guess the, the fastest processes that you can then uh, measure is then dependent on, I guess, the, the millisecond number that you mentioned. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, so it was in you know it's probably 10 hertz in that paper that's okay. as fast as we could go yeah. okay. thank you um yeah so the problem is this signal is small and essentially then you can do a do a calculation if you wanted to have you know kilodalton sensitivity you need to detect a lot of photons and essentially you're again a factor of 10 to the 6 out you have to put so much light on and you get so much light back that any camera that you can use is essentially going to blow up. So what do you do? Right? You, still, you can still put more, there's more light to be put on, but you can't detect it. Now the way of saying that is, you know, is there a way of enhancing the contrast? All right. Um, so how do we enhance the single molecule contrast? So here is a possibility, and this, this is an interesting one, this is during my postdoc time, it's completely unrelated. Um, uh, you know, one of the challenges in quantum optics is that you have a single emitter and you want to 
you want to get every photon that that single emitter emits, because if you get every photon, then you can do quantum optics efficiently. And then that was kind of rumbling around. And it turns out if you take, if you take a single emitter and you put it in an interface between high refractive index and low and refractive index, almost all of the light is emitted in a particular direction. Right? So it looks something, something like this. And then we thought, well, what we're really trying to do here is we want to get all of the scattered light and we want to put lots of light on the sample, but we want to reduce the amount of background light, the light that is just reflected at the interface. So how do we reduce the background light without reducing the scattered light? Well, this is your answer, right? If this is your objective, your scatterer scatters only to the outside. If you illuminate your sample, you can do what people call as white field illumination. So you essentially focus your laser beam into the back focal plane of the objective and that creates white field illumination. So your laser beam is only, if you like, in the middle of the objective lens. And so what we did is we took a piece of glass, put a little mirror on it, uh, reflected off of the mirror, and this mirror transmits only 0.1% of the light. So all the light that is reflected comes back, most of it goes back into the laser, only a small fraction goes through. So you change R, but ice doesn't change. So the, the scattered light is on the outside uh, and still hits the camera. So what does that actually do? If you don't have a mask, remember you have this image, and then when you translate it, you subtract the, the, the laser beam, you get a few percent. If you have a mask that transmits only 1% of the light, now already in the image of the laser, you can already see the glass roughness because you enhance the contrast. And when you look at the glass roughness here, you see it's a factor of 10 bigger. And that's exactly what you would expect. You reduce the reflected light by a factor of 100, you get a square root of 100 improvement in contrast, so it's a factor of 10. So in other words, I, I, I solve two problems. One is my contrast gets bigger, and two is I reduce the amount of light hitting my camera. And when I use this setup in order to look at single molecules, I get a movie that looks like this. All right. Now I'm not looking at molecules binding to acting and moving. I'm simply watching molecules land on a piece of glass. The reason why they appear and disappear is because I still have to do my odd law, no odd law subtraction. So I'm always subtracting frames 10 to 20 from frames zero to 10. So if the molecule binds in the middle, I get a big signal. If it's already there, it disappears. If it isn't there, it disappears. But you can see now the signal to noise ratio is amazing. Right? I mean, it's as good as you get in fluorescence effectively for a single molecule. And the reason why that's important is, so we take this difference, we get the signal. The reason why that's important is Essentially what we're doing is we're averaging uh, a bunch of frames here and a bunch of frames here, and we're sliding this across in time. And depending on when the molecule binds, we will therefore see a different signal. If the molecule binds exactly in the middle between the two frames, I get the maximum contrast. And before and after I get a smaller contrast. And this is how the contrast changes as a function of frame number. If you can measure it like this, what you can also then do is you can determine this number very, very, very precisely, which essentially means that you can measure the scattering contrast from one molecule with very high precision, all right? So you get high precision and you get a big signal. So now a 400 kilodalton protein produces a signal that's almost a percent. Nobody's scared of a percent, right? 1% is easy to measure. Everyone can measure 1%. But everything gets better, also life gets worse. You then realize, uh, essentially, you remember we have this glass roughness. Uh, 10 kilodalton corresponds to one angstrom. Because we're taking differences. If your, if your glass cover slip shifts by one angstrom, it produces a signal that corresponds to about 10 kilodalton. So you need a super stable setup. We spend a lot of time making this more and more and more stable. So let me show you what the setup actually looks like and also what the experiment looks like. So, so here you nope. see, 
uh, here you see essentially just the laser, you turn the laser off. Uh, here's a bit of buffer. Yeah, this is the microscope objective. You take a few microliters of your sample, you add it to the buffer, close the lid, turn the laser on, and there you have molecules. Okay, so that's that's actually how the experiment works, right? And they just bind, uh, uh, bind, bind to cover glass. And the, you know, there's there's a lot of engineering in there, but ultimately, you know, when we did the first experiments like this, it had to be two people. One person was clicking the mouse, and the other person was adding the buffer. And then when they added the buffer, they had to hold still and not breathe for thirty seconds because the setup was so sensitive. Okay, because one angstrom is not a lot, right? But with all this engineering now, it's much better. All right, so I'm kind of coming to the end of, of day one. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, a small doubt, like uh, in your uh, image, you had actually sometimes this black color spot with a white color halo around it, right? So yeah. uh, like in between, I also saw a white spot with a uh, sort of yeah. so, like why, why is it so i'm just curious that's very good so it, it, exactly you're right when you let me see if i can find it there see the white spot sorry i can't i'm pointing with my hand which doesn't work i realize but yeah. i can't point right. with my mouse and stop the movie at the same time so if you think about it we get a black spot when a protein lands okay we get a white spot when the protein leaves okay okay yeah but this is non-specific binding. So 99.9% .9 of all events are binding events. Every once in a while, a protein will go chow chow. But interestingly, the contrast when it's leaving is the same as the contrast when it arrives, which is what you would expect. Oh, well, that's really nice. All right. All right, so I hope I've shown you yeah, a little bit the, the kind of background, how we got to the point where we could take movies of single proteins uh, without having to use fluorescence that look a little bit like, like what's here. Uh, and uh, tomorrow I'll tell you all about, hopefully the, uh, what we think are the really, really exciting things that you can do once you have this capability. So I'm just gonna finish with saying thank you. I mean, of course, couldn't have done that without people who did the funding. Um, uh, this is an old group photo uh, from, from a bunch of years ago. And I just need to highlight Dan Cole and Gavin Young. So they were the ones who really pushed the technology towards making movies that look like this. And it's really the movies that look like this that enable everything that I'm going to tell you about tomorrow. And with that, I hope I'm okay with time and I'm happy Perfect. to take any further questions. Perfect. Oh. Perfect. Fantastic, fantastic. So um, uh, we will have questions now. I think Satish has raised. Yeah, hand. so uh, yes, it's a, yeah, so it's a, it's a beautiful experiment. I think thank you very much for sharing and explaining so beautifully. I had more general questions. I was just trying to correlate. So people are doing this transport me measurement in single molecules. So this they call single molecule electronics. Uh, do you, if you suppose, if I want to rationalize the transport, because there again, when they put single molecule, their contacts, electrodes come into picture. So essentially, those are the some of the factors which you have to account when you are explaining the unusual transport behavior. So similarly, is is there any correlation can be drawn by seeing this emission spectra and uh, uh, the, the one which I, I'm talking about, the, your first experiment, what you did, where you can see the fluorescence-based systems. So I learn about transport. Uh, I, I'm sorry if it is fall beyond your expertise, actually. No, so no, it's fine. I mean, my, my feeling would be that in principle, it should be very helpful because I would expect the optical properties of the molecule to change depending on what state it is in, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So if you're pushing electrons in and out, I would expect the optical properties to change in the same way that they change when you absorb a photon or emit a photon. True. Yeah. I That's think the of, real I... challenge would be to optically investigate a molecule like that. And I think that's where you're gonna run into trouble because, um, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know what happened here. Um, because, 
um, because you have all the other stuff around, right? You have the contacts and you have gold and you have all this other stuff that you need for your transport measurements. Sure, sure. And you're going to be illuminating all of that. And I think that's going to produce a lot more signal than the signal that you would like to be reading out from your single molecule. So while I agree with you in principle that you could use optical readout to get more information about what's going on, I think in practice, it's probably very challenging. Yeah. Okay. That's good. So I was talking about more. I think people might be doing it with STM. Yeah, they're doing it as STM only. But but I was yeah, talking and, about and, how do you how do you image a single molecule with charged species? So you inject the carriers in a single molecule, mm, and then mm, can you image that? Mm, I was thinking about in that aspect. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, what we're really measuring is polarizability. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you had a difference in polarizability, then you know you might be able to see a difference for different charges. Okay, Vivek. Okay. Yeah, uh, Philip, beautiful talk. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I have like two questions which I think they're kind of interrelated. Uh, so the first question is: So you mentioned that uh, you know the spatial resolution, or, or you know the, the smallest movements that you could differentiate, uh, not the smallest movements, but smallest length scales. They are of the other of the most strong, like the, the glass roughness, or I think you related it to that. So when the yeah. question becomes, is let us say you were to somehow slow down the diffusion of the protein as it is landing on the tower step, uh, would you be able to resolve, uh, you know, these uh, protein fluctuations, which are, you know, there are protein fluctuations of the order of seconds, for example, I think state transitions in photosynthetic complexes and, and so on, mm. you know, all this mm. stuff. Uh, and also, like, to the same end, uh, have you considered the use of pulsed lasers so that you get more photons in shorter amount of time and then you could you know, play some gating tricks because I saw there was a deflector in your setup after the laser. So yeah, yeah. So I uh, maybe I'll start with a simple one, which is the full pulse lasers. We just haven't tried. Okay. I always make the assumption that CW is better uh, because it blows stuff up less. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you start concentrating energy not only in space but also in time. Mm -hmm. You might blow stuff up more, but. To be honest, I think if I had a good nanosecond laser lying around, I would probably try and see what happens, but I've never had one, so I never tried. Um, uh, there may well be an advantage, but we just haven't, we've never really tested it. In terms of the motion, again, that's an interesting question. Um, and it's quite tricky. So I think that the, it's one thing to detect that the cover slip moves by one angstrom, because it's a large object with many spatial features and we can, we can actually quantify that. To see structural fluctuations in a protein, the thing you have to keep in mind is that the protein is just the blob because the protein is much smaller than the fraction limit. So it's just the blob. And the shape of the blob changes the shape of the blob. You're not gonna be able to see because they're too small because it's convolved with the, with the point spread function of your microscope. So the only thing that you would see would be fluctuations in the in the scattering intensity because structural fluctuations somehow change the polarizability of the molecule. Mm -hmm. Now there was a paper recently where people have calculated what they think these changes in polarizability are. And the answer was it's small. So it's going to be really hard to detect. Not again, not impossible, but it's small. And then if it's small and fast, then you're really running into a lot of trouble. Uh, um, and if you think about it, you know, what, one indicator as to how difficult this may be is we've now measured probably, or people have measured, you know, by now, probably more than a thousand different proteins. Nobody's yet told me of a protein that is wildly off the mark in terms of the polarizability. And proteins have lots and lots of different shapes and they're all kind of the same in polarizability terms. So my feeling is that this is not the approach that you want if you're interested in structural fluctuations of proteins. If you want that, 
you know, something like FRET or NMR is your best friend, I, I think. Thank you. Okay, should it talk? Yeah, hi, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kukura, it's a very nice, very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, if you look at the scattering amplitude as a function of wavelength, suppose you do two colors or even better, use a variable wavelength laser, then knowing that the scattering amplitude has a certain relationship with uh, the lambda, would you be able to tell the size of the particle by that? You detect a particle, but then you want to know whether it's uh, something small, something large, how big is it? And you do a sort of a scattering scan at different wavelengths, plot the scattering amplitudes and uh, see if you can look at this, you know, tell, tell the size, is that something possible? Yeah, I think it should tell you the polarization. It should tell you, I mean, uh, it should tell you the polarizability, right? It, sh it should work, it should okay. work. I mean, we, we haven't, we haven't worried about using the optical measurement per se to give us size information because we always use a calibration. So I'll talk about the calibration in terms of mass tomorrow, but very often, you know, you have your setup and you measure 10 nanometer gold, 20 nanometer gold, 30 nanometer gold, 40 nanometer gold. Those sizes are verified by TEM. Right. You measure many particles, you make a histogram of 10, 20, 30, 40, and you get a you get a line and then you know the relationship between you know for a given signal you know what size your particle is uh, but you're right in principle you should be able to do that i think you should be able to do that with wavelength as well thank you i mean one of the reasons why we haven't done much with different wavelengths is it's actually difficult to get enough power uh, so then you have to use multiple lasers and it gets complicated, but it's it's a good idea, definitely. Thanks. Okay, um, could you actually, Phil? Uh, just a quick question. Um, you you hinted in some for, for everybody's uh, uh, sake. Again, go back to your mass calibration in the first data sets that you had shown the histograms. Um, how do you do that mass calibration? Like you had few kilodalton. Um, ah. We're going to talk about mass calibration tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. I just gave you a, you know, roughly. Right, right. Okay. I mean, I can tell you, look, I could see my actin filament. I know the signal from my actin filament. I know how many proteins per diffraction limit right. spot. Right. I know it's three megadalton. I can do the numbers. Right. I get a rough idea. Right. But a mass calibration is a different beast. So I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, there is a question in the chat box, which actually says, Suraj Yadav says, can you please elaborate the application part of the single molecule? I think this will be second talk, Suraj. Second talk, yeah. I will spend an hour on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, question, Shoban. Shoban, yeah. I feel it's fantastic, you know, great uh, you know, innovative ideas. Uh, few things that, you know, uh, like what you just mentioned that probably for the structural analysis, uh, FRET is the better uh, friend in that way. Uh, is it then possible that you combine this along with the FRET that, you know, you have the proteins that really going and uh, attaching to the surface on the top, you have another objective, you uh, collect the fluorescence and then probably with that, you'll be able to talk about the structural information about that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's just a question of wavelength availability. Exactly. So I, I think that's the uh, you know more tricky yeah. part to really uh, look into. But a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And second thing is that you know is it at all possible uh, where, to look at the Raman signal? Probably not. Oh, well, you know, I, mean, I, ha I have a I have a long. I have a long history and love of Raman. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so I think. But JD, JD would say I, that anyway. I think, uh, I think once a year I do the calculation. Uh -huh. Great. Uh, once, once a year I take a piece of paper and I go, oh, surely, this, surely, uh, no. <laughs> um, but I think actually uh, it's, it's probably worse than that, um, for, at least from my personal perspective. You know, Raman has this mythical thing of chemical fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can not only will I be able to tell 
that there is a protein there, but I can also tell which protein it is because I get the chemical fingerprint. Exactly. And that's, that's how I grew up uh, as a Raman spectroscopist. And as you'll see tomorrow, um, at least I have been, in, in terms of protein identification, I have been converted to mass. <laughs> because you take protein A, protein B, protein C, you know, they're all the same amino acids. The difference in Raman spectra are not big if you don't have chromophores flying around. Sure, sure. It's tough to tell the difference on the Raman spectrum. And then it's going to be even tougher to tell the difference if you only have one protein, if you somehow manage to measure the spectrum. But mass, right? You know, 60 versus 80 kilodalton or 100, that's good. And if you can measure that precisely and accurately, uh, yeah, so I, I don't mean to speak badly of Raman spectroscopy because I am a big fan, but I think in this very specific application, maybe mass wins. Sure, sure. Great. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Cool, cool, Shavon. Thank you. Um, any other question from students or uh, attendees here? I don't see any hand up. Well, there aren't any, I think. So that gives Phil um, a bit of a relief, I think, for today. So Phil, uh, thank you very much for doing the first talk. And um, it was fantastic. Um, uh, you went through the basics very slowly and calmly. So I, I think people have food for thought and they'll read the papers going back. And tomorrow we'll start um, with your applications. And if there are any questions from the previous talk, so it might, yeah. you know, you, you can marinate on them. So, so, so think yeah, about it. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to end this series by this particular talk uh, by saying that uh, we are actually thankful to ACS, uh, Diksha Gupta and Ajay Cha for putting this all together. So thank you, uh, Diksha. Thanks, thank you, Ajay. Sadish, any yeah, words? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think uh, people can think over it. You know, they can, perhaps we can start this session if they have even questions tomorrow for today's talk also. It's fine. So we can begin from there, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Brilliant. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Yeah, you. take Bye -bye. care. Take yeah. care. Bye -bye. Have a good lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Judy. Bye.